Hi everyone, I'm Nancy Ayres, the Chief Operating Officer of the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land which I'm speaking to you all, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to extend the acknowledgement to all traditional custodians across the lands we occupy. Welcome to the first session for day two of Digital Directions 2020. Metadata Matters, Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence and the Road Ahead. For this session, I'm delighted to be welcoming a group of peers from across the Pacific, from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to the Boston Celtics, who are joining us to talk about unlocking the full value of their collections. Before I hand over to our moderator, Josh Wiggins from Grey Meta, I'd like to again invite you all to take part in the conversation by adding your questions to the chat window below. Thank you for joining us for Digital Directions 2020 and enjoy the presentation. Hello and welcome to Digital Directions session this morning, uh, Metadata Matters, Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence and the Road Ahead. Just a, a quick um, introduction, my name's Torsten Kading, I'm going to be joining throughout and um, particularly joining in the question session at the end of the presentation. You may have heard from Nancy there about the chat window below. Um, what we're actually wanting people to do is go onto Twitter and Facebook, use hashtag digital directions, uh, put your questions through there. You can put them through at any time during the presentation and we'll get to those at the end. But right now, I'd like to hand over to Josh Wiggins from Grey Meta. Good afternoon. Well, uh, well, good morning in Australia. So uh, my name is Josh Wiggins and uh, I'm going to walk you through a, uh, a story and a journey from a couple of different organizations around the world. And we're going to focus on why metadata matters and what people are doing about it. So this may look familiar to some of you. Um, like what is in your library? What is in your collection? This is actually uh, a library from one of our customers, Video Fashion, based out of New York. And they've been working with us for a couple of years now. And the goal was to understand what is buried deep inside this library and the collection. And there's a lot of things that you can be done about it with the metadata that's actually hidden deep inside these assets. The reality check is, and this is what we like to talk to people about, is analog and videotape, film, paper, photos, all these valuable assets and items that sit within these libraries and collections around the world, it takes a lot of human horsepower to easily under to understand what's going on inside there. And the trouble with that is the human capital takes time and effort and costs money as well. So we're looking to find out where we can get the help of the machines to create this level of intelligent metadata using services like machine learning, AI services, cognitive services. But the challenge is these services don't run easily on piles of paper or cardboard boxes. The image that we showed earlier is actually uh, from Video Fashion's library, and they were able to take photos of the boxes with the labels on it and use OCR to try to help them understand what might have been inside the box instead of having to take the lid off and look deep inside. So it's a great example about how you can start very easily with machine learning and AI services. But the key is you've got to have a plan to leverage digital workflows, leverage the cloud, leverage technology that may be within your own personal data center. And we're going to talk through some of those options today. Very often we find people think they know what they have, but they don't. This is a very common type of picture that we get or a verbal message. It says, I have X terabytes, or I have 900,000 assets, or a million photos. But very often, we don't know what might be inside those files, or those folders, or the zip files, or someone that scanned them, or the, the files may have been created 10 years ago, and you've had three different members of staff. So what we're really, really focusing on with organizations that we're going to hear from today is how do you really understand what is buried deep inside these folders, these files, these digital assets that are taking up storage either locally within your facilities uh, or up in cloud um, storage options. Now, these stats are actually uh, about four or five years old, but we're actually finding that they're actually true. Um, we find a lot of the creative workflows that we're supporting, a lot of the galleries, archives, and museums around the world, that people are having repetitive tasks. So what we've been able to find is when we're able to leverage machine learning or AI services, even the most basic of services like OCR or speech to text, we're able to really help save time and remove those repetitive tasks, thus making the workforce a little bit more efficient. We're also finding that so much time is spent 
um, in the work week or the weekends searching for things. And you really want to be able to find it. So we're trying to flip things into finding, spend time finding things, not searching. And we're going to hear some great stories from some of the accounts that we mentioned earlier, like Video Fashion, Rock Call, Celtics, and PBS, about how they're using the creation of metadata from machine learning to actually do this. So a lot of people tell us that they've had the library for a long time, or that they know what's there, or they've got someone that goes and looks at it, or they've got a team of people that are writing everything down. But sometimes when you can see your library, or you can touch it, or sometimes smell it, whatever it might be, whether it's uh, physical things like clothing or artifacts that have been sent into the collection of the museum, you really want to be able to get inside, right? You want more. So you're trying to understand like what is inside that video file? What is inside these 19 zip files that someone may have passed to you or you got inherited from the person that worked there before? Or an old zip file that was passed to you. You want to get inside these files. Look inside these documents. If you've got hundreds of pages of a document that was scanned, you're going to have to have someone go through and read all of that, but we can use automated methods to actually create metadata that will take seconds now to find a certain word where a certain person said something or handwriting. So we really want to get inside these files that we have, whether they're documents, photos, or videos. This is very often the conversations that we're having. People have got large amounts of videos or images or notes that like we've seen recently where someone had millions and millions of um, scanned documents. And in those scanned documents were actually photos, but they didn't realize they were photos because they were scanned on a, on a uh, scanner with a default setting. And they just thought they were uh, PDFs of documents, but they had very valuable images in them. So we're finding very often that these libraries have many different types of files in there. They spread across years and years. Uh, very often there's a digitization plan that's in place and you're trying to have a, the minimal budget to not spend too much money digitizing things that you may not need to. So how do you find out what might be in those boxes? Like I showed earlier with those pictures of video fashion, maybe we can use OCR to look what's on the label to help you figure out what, what your priority should be to go through those libraries. And very often we're finding that people really just want to be able to um, share things quicker. There's new people, there's new projects, new digital initiatives, and especially in these current times, People are trying to figure out how do we quickly make these collections and libraries accessible to the global communities and the countries that we live in? Because people now are looking for more things online. They have more time on their hands given the current restrictions that people have. And often there's a limited set of tools or expertise around. We're finding that um, a lot of the library and archive teams, they may not have uh, excess resource around to work on these projects. So we find that there might be legacy technologies in place with some people that have some expertise in new technologies. So how do you bring these tools and expertise together? So this is what we find to be very familiar with across many of the libraries that we're working with globally. Video fashion is a, a, a video we're gonna hear from in a minute. And just so everyone realizes, I'm the only person doing this live because it's actually Thanksgiving here in uh, the United States, which is where I am. Um, you probably tell by uh, my accent, I'm thankful to be here, but um, I'm British, so I'm not celebrating Thanksgiving. So what we've done is we've asked um, four of these organizations like Video Fashion to pre-record a kind of eight to uh, nine minute interview that we had with them to talk about it. So we're going to be hearing from Video Fashion, but this is exactly what they walked into about four years ago when we started speaking to them to try and help them access, monetize, and use their library. Very often, People might think, oh, it's all the photos or it's the videos. But what we find more and more uh, times is that if you can get your hands on all of the different files easily and, and start them together, because very often you may find that a audio file might help you understand what was also in these images. Um, or we find documents like caption files. Very often you can save hundreds and hundreds of dollars by if you have some caption files that were available from a broadcaster, that will save you spending money on speech to text. So we like to say to people, you should look at all the different assets that you have. Um, and again, some take more um, time than others to process a video for some of these services, a little bit more expensive than processing a document. So again, look at all the different types of uh, files that you may have within your library. The key that we're gonna hear as we go through these four videos is that we all say to people, set yourself up for kind of being ready operationally. How do you get this so that your teams can use? Find that point where you get some quick success. And it may not be the most glamorous of, of use cases that you're trying to solve for. So we say the key to this when creating metadata using some of these automated methods is to really get yourself set up for operational readiness. Make sure it can be used in the business. If you're going to do a pilot or a POC, make sure it can be deployed operationally. 
right away. As soon as you get success in that trial, you want to be able to deploy it immediately so that your team can benefit from it. Now, how do we get here? So a lot of work has been done over the years, going back 20, 30, 40 years and more. We've had facilities, we've had people in them. Um, these became silo. This is where a lot of our silos created, especially with a lot of merger and acquisitions in bigger enterprise companies. It became expensive and we had geographic constraints. Then what happened is, and this is on the human capital that we put into these organizations years ago, because we're going to see in a minute about why the human capital that's been working in these organizations for years is so important now with things like AI and machine learning. The other challenge is that people tend to get distracted or they could get bored or they move on to other jobs or all the costs could go up. So the, what happened is, oh, wrong way. So then we started to leverage cloud services. This brought us the scale. It allowed us to get things done and reduce costs in certain workloads or workflows. And that was great, but what we needed is we needed more automation. I've worked on a number of projects eight, nine, 10 years ago where we used human capital. We found retired people around the world that knew a particular sport so that for a library, we could actually use those people uh, with a cloud service portal to actually create metadata. Well, the trouble is it didn't scale very well because it mean we needed more and more people and that cost went up. This is where the machine learning and cognitive services comes in to help. It gets smarter over time. There's many different ways that you can integrate this into different platforms and tools within your organizations. But the key thing is the machine learning and AI it does need to be trained. It needs to understand what something is and what something isn't. And, and, and we don't want to forget the people within the organizations that have that 20, 30, sometimes there may be 50 years, 60 years of knowledge within a particular individual. That knowledge is great to try and take those that staff, that team member, and retrain them in some of these new tools to allow them to do this because we need the humans to help the machines understand what something is and what something isn't. Otherwise, we end up with this kind of scenario. Some of you may have seen this slide if you Google, how do you know if AI is right or machine learning? We were actually presented this slide from a customer when we did a project for the Royal Wedding in England several years ago. Well, the thing is the machine needs to know what is the muffin and what is the chihuahua. So you've got to train it that, you've got to give it the negative training. So while in this case, most people around the world would know the difference, when you get into some of these libraries with a lot of different types of uh, content and artifacts in there, you want those specialists to understand it. So we need the human capital that we have, that we've invested in our teams. We're using those to train and create these models with AI services and machine learning so that we can actually raise the, the level of accuracy that we have within these services. Now, we didn't just arrive here. Uh, many of you uh, in the archive community, um, you've, you've, you've spent a lot of money on big boxes, big machines, tape libraries. Um, we've been digitizing these physical analog assets for years. Then, obviously, born digital, we started to get into the digital arena, and that allowed us to kind of we were on premise storage. Then we started to leverage the cloud, and then we had the, the smarts of the cloud compute came along. This really started to help. And now, what we're doing is we really started to embrace in that cloud environment the ability to automatically create this metadata, which is driving automation and efficiency. And we're going to hear that from these four uh, interviews that we recorded. If you listen to people that actually have started and they're on their journey. And the key thing that we always hear, and you should pick up on this in some of the uh, videos we're about to hear, is that there's a lot of surprise about how simple it can be or the ease to find success. So what we like to say is the key here is really focus on the what and the why, right? Not necessarily the how. The technology is great, it's getting better. There's lots of it out there. But if you really focus on why you need something and what it is that you need, then you're gonna find that you're gonna find success through more of a simplistic, easy approach than getting really caught up in complexities and difficulty as you look at automated metadata. So with that, we're gonna hear now from a, a series of interviews that we've recorded, because um, it's three o'clock here on the west coast of uh, the US. These people are probably busy eating their uh, turkey right now. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through these videos. Uh, all these people are more than happy to connect with any of you um, following this event, and we're gonna have some takeaways from this, and I'm gonna uh, go through. Hello, I'm Anna Dami, and I am the co-founder and managing editor of Video Fashion and the Video Fashion Library. We are storytellers in fashion, and fashion is a wonderful topic. It's highly visual, uh, it's a worldwide topic, 
it's non-political. Everyone is talking about the same trends and the same looks. We're a, a worldwide culture now and everyone communicates. It's all instantaneous. And whether you like it or not, you have to get up every morning. Maybe you wake up naked and you have to get dressed. And when you get dressed, you are saying something about who you are and how you want to project yourself in the world, even over Zoom. And I consider myself now kind of the library lady. I am very invested in preserving and monetizing our 44 year old library. We have over 3000 programs, 20,000 segments comprised of 18,000 hours of original footage, all of which we have preserved and maintained. We shot it ourselves. It's 100% owned by myself and my um, partner, my business partner, Nicholas Charney, who came from print publishing and wanted to found the world's first video magazine, hence video fashion. Metadata is everything. Uh, we can't go in and find 3,000 programs in one server without having some kind of really remarkable system to access that material, cross-reference that material, and find precisely what we are looking for. Metadata uh, is a, a term that has a lot of different meanings. Certainly uh, in the 1980s and the late 70s, metadata was just a handwritten, or if you were lucky, a typed sheet. Uh, we have been through every analog and digital phase of trying to record, store, and understand what we had in our library for decades. Um, metadata now is all about machine learning. When we use the Curio platform, we are using five different absolutely remarkable tools. Uh, we have all 3,000 of our programs up on the platform and we can um, ask for something as simple as a designer. For example, Carl Lagerfeld, everyone has heard of Carl Lagerfeld who designed Chanel and Fendi and it just passed away in this past year. Uh, he literally will come up <laughs> over 1,500, 1,576 times, even more. Uh, so then we will use the machine learning to say, well, what are we looking for? Carl Lagerfeld and Chanel, Carl Lagerfeld and Fendi. Are we looking to find out is he uh, in an interview? Is it B-roll? Um, is he backstage? Is he at a photo shoot? All of that. And our metadata can do all that through five different tools. Uh, the first one we use uh, that we started with um, was this remarkable speech to text. So we could take everything that was in our video programs and see a script and cross-reference it with another script and find any reference in any of the programs where they, Carl Lagerfeld was talked about or was speaking. Uh, we also are utilizing uh, OCR, optical, optical character recognition, uh, which means titles uh, or anything written in the background or a face ID, uh, which is a remarkable tool. Um, the backstage scenes often have um, notes to the models or you'll see a label and you'll be able to recognize it, uh, which moves us to another optical recognition, which is specifically logos. And everyone is very interested in branding these days. And you can train the platform to recognize logos. For example, um, just last winter, we were working on a big project for Louis Vuitton, and we trained the platform to find all the many permutations of the LV logo. So that was absolutely terrific. Uh, and last but not least is uh, facial recognition. We have trained the platform to recognize the people that are part of the fashion industry. Uh, Yves Saint Laurent, Karl Lagerfeld, Ralph Lauren, uh, Cindy Crawford, Anna Wintour, the list goes on and on. And we did train it with many hundreds of people to start with. And it is amazing what a good job does of finding people. Also, uh, Curio uh, recognizes celebrities, for example, your Rihanna or your Gigi Hadid. We don't have to do facial recognition because 
um, they are part of a, a, a bigger package of facial recognition. I think the most important thing I've learned about machine learning is don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, the idea of understanding what was in our library and how we were going to access it was actually uh, a journey we took for over a year. Uh, we are a small company and our systems for accessing our information was not at all sophisticated and uh, MAMs are extremely expensive and require a lot of information in order to implement. Uh, so we, we jumped over the MAM and went directly to looking at AI and we met the Gray Meta people very early on and we couldn't resist the the allure of how simply it was going to be able to help us to access our archives and therefore be in a better position to monetize it. In the past, uh, can um, we can often license our archive for as much as up to $135 per second. So being able to find that really special scene for a documentarian is extremely important to us. And the bottom line is access means more information, means more monetizing and more ways that we can use it. And the faster you can find footage and the faster you can deliver footage in this instantaneous world, uh, the more monetizing you can do, the more efficient you can be. You can have your people working on other things because you've already found the footage that your client is looking for. I'll give you one example. Um, I had a call uh, just a couple of weeks ago and um, a documentarian was looking for uh, shots of Kanye West. Uh, Kanye has been in the fashion community and attended fashion shows for a very long time. Um, now, of course, he shows up on the red carpet quite regularly with Kim, uh, but it took me literally less than five minutes to go onto the Curio platform and find that we had 52 instances of Kanye being interviewed and available on our platform to deliver to that client. And literally that client stayed on the phone and I looked it up and said, we have Kanye West 52 times. Fashion has benefited greatly from having our Curio platform in place. It has not only helped me to find footage in our library that I couldn't possibly have imagined existed or that I had an opportunity to even remember was there. It jogs my institutional memory, but it also finds things that are just incredible and I am always so thrilled and so delighted to find material I didn't know we had. One thing about machine learning that I wish it could do is read analog. And it does in Word documents, but uh, we wish it could actually do all the digitizing that needs to be done so we could get on with it because we still have thousands of hours that we would like to digitize and access and to utilize. We actually uh, have been working with a film group right now that has a very major mini-series uh, topic um, where literally they are going to access our archive in such a massive manner that we're saying to them, our archive is your archive. And because we are in pandemic times, take a look at our thousands of interviews and build back from the moment then to tell your story now and use these interviews and use all this footage and put it in context of what was happening then. I think a lot of storytellers are going to get really much better at using archives properly and having different formats for telling these stories. Start early, it's, it's worth the investment. Um, An AI investment means uh, more monetization. Uh, you find things you never know you had. And it's uh, an amazing tool for moving um, your analog to digital as you have projects and you can prioritize and move it along. You don't have to do it all at once. Start with what you need. Start with what the clients want and get going. Thank you, Anna, for that fascinating look at, I suppose, the real diversity 
that we're seeing in digital collections across all the different realms. Josh, um, wondering what your take from that is. Yeah, thanks. So um, that was Anne there in New York. So yeah, so a couple of takeaways here is uh, the, the, the descriptive metadata is definitely giving them uh, opportunities to monetize and they're constantly calling us with things they never thought they could do, but they find things within kind of seconds. Uh, it's also allowing them to uh, make it easier for other third parties to access it, um, their library. And again, they're a very small organization with not a lot of uh, embedded technology and a very small team. So I think that's the takeaway. Now we'll uh, go on and uh, hear from uh, PBS. Hi, I'm Sally Hubbard, and I'm Director of Media Management at PBS, uh, which is you know, a major public service broadcaster in the United States, uh, stands for Public Broadcasting Service. Um, at the moment, I'm really looking at the move towards the cloud of our, the move towards the cloud of our media operations, and of course, how to make sure we have the metadata component of that move sorted out or thought through that we're prepared for the um, to manage metadata within that context. I define metadata as everything about the thing, but not the thing itself. Um, and what that means is that metadata provides the grips or the handles for your things, your content. Um, it allows you to find it, to know what you found, um, lets you know how you can use it. And I think as we move more and more towards automated cloud-based systems, uh, which effectively means the content's becoming ever more opaque, uh, metadata is becoming more important because it's really our, our access point to um, everything, to, to doing anything, finding our content or doing anything with it. PBS has been around since 1969. So with all archives that go back a fair ways, you're going to get inconsistency over time. But yeah, I think generally speaking, that series title episode type data is pretty robust within the TV industry, right? There's, there are good models out there to use. It's really the time based um, looking in, looking inside the episodes at the segment clip or frame level has really been a big gap. It just wasn't practical to, to do that, to get that kind of metadata, except for very specific and usually sort of somewhat idiosyncratic projects. And of course, we had, um, well, I mean, it, it's you get closed caption and subtitle data, which is time-based. Um, you don't have that for all content, but that's also that's a very good source of metadata. But it's um, it doesn't give you descriptive metadata and other pieces. Okay, so the project we did with machine learning was a proof of concept, um, and what we're doing right now is we're folding that into our plans for moving to the cloud. To cloud, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the group that's actually using it as we speak is actually our innovation group, which is looking at um, using it for recommendation engines, which is an obvious use case. Um, and that's one of the things that we'd also be interested in collaborating with them or folding into our regular operations um, as we move forward. I think one of the sort of precursors we really need is our content in the cloud to make it practical. And that's, we have to, there are some dependencies there. We, we did a project where we trained on Sesame Street characters to do object recognition, to recognize Muppets. I don't know how familiar <laughs> people are with Sesame Street. It's a preschool program, um, much fated and admired. Uh, but we also did speech to text. We did, this is again, something that Curio brought to the table was lots and lots of different types of metadata. We're looking at using it for um, speech to text, object recognition, facial recognition is something that's really, we didn't play around with that so much with our um, pilot. Of course, you have to be aware of some of the biases there, but that's something you have to manage judiciously, I think. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, the, there are multiple types of machine learning that give you multiple types of metadata back that have various uses. I know that's a bit broad. So we could use look at it for segmentation or compliance, catching nudity, catching, you know, inappropriate language, that type of thing. We could also use it for just saying, okay, we need to find an example of this character doing this thing, and that's more descriptive. So what we're really looking to be able to set together multiple different types. Um, specifically in terms of machine learning, I think machine learning generated metadata, a major channel is res resourcing, not having the um, human resources or the capital maybe to, to um, be able to get started with that. Um, and I think that was actually one of the great benefits of uh, being able to test out Curio because it was it's so user friendly. It provides a very use, straightforward way of using multiple machine learning services. So it lifts a big burden right there. It's um, kind of a one stop shop to get in there and kick the tires, if you like. Um, I, I will say we went into this with a fair amount of skepticism. 
I think in part because machine learning has often been hyped as something of a magic bullet. Um, but if you to put that aside and view it as augmented or, assist, or assistive, assistive technology and, and use it judiciously, it really can be immensely helpful. Like it really is a practical um, proposition, but it's, yeah, it's not a magic bullet. Um, I think it was also the work we were able to do was have a level of, level of effort involved. Um, and again, it's different for the different types of service you're using, but there was, um, we, we got a sense of, okay, how hard is it to train object recognition for a Muppet from Sesame Street? And that gave us the ability to decide, well, is it worth it? What, what's, what, at what level is it worth it? So it gave us a much more tangible sense of machine learning as a, a real practical tool and when it's worth it and when it's not worth it and what it's good at and what it's not good at. And it kind of got away from this, you know, the, what's the, the hype cycle curve? It got us into more like, okay, no, this really is a useful thing that we could do with this caveat, with this level of investment, with this business decision to be made about whether it's worth it to us. I'd say try it out. I mean, the barriers to entry are fairly low nowadays. That's something else that has, I think, changed fairly recently. Um, one of the things we do, which I think is, is great if you can do it, is um, try to tie the use of machine learning and metadata generated through it to your broader information domain. I mean, a big part of what we were looking at was being able to connect um, machine learning insights with our knowledge graph we're building. And um, that gives you greater control over accuracy and relevancy. Uh, so if possible, try and integrate it into a, don't, don't treat it as something that's just off to the side, integrate it into your broader strategy or strategic approach. The integration between Curio and um, Pool Party, which is our knowledge graph tool, was the easiest integration I've ever done in any project I've ever managed because everyone was using standards, it's all API based, it's all cloud based. It was a sort of sense of that thing that people talk about, API integration. And it was like, oh, that really worked. That really, that was, I mean, really, I've been doing this for a long time and that was the smoothest integration I've ever had. And, and, it, it, and it was for a pilot, but it was, wasn't done in a wiki wacky pilot workaround way. It was done in a way that is production ready, that could be applied. So, I mean, I, I, I was impressed by that. The core benefit we're looking for to get at the end of our sort of journey to the cloud and the integration of things like machine learning is a richly and accurately described archive. And that once you have that, there are so many benefits, right? Uh, but I could, you know, about recommendations and search and discovery about robust management, including retention schedule. Um, say you discover you're storing 20 identical copies of something, then you can maybe rationalize that or conversely discover that actually there are these quite important differences between these, these 20, uh, what we thought were copies and we need to hang on to them. So I think that kind of stuff can definitely be assisted with uh, machine learning uh, and sort of scaled up and made more feasible. Um, and I mentioned before the smoothing media operations and processing. I think we're also looking to be able to share content, I guess sort of in a silo busting way, be able to have share content across um, divisions and of course going back to tying it into our broader information ecosystem you, you need to tie it back to your rights and what you can use and what you can't use and how you can use it that kind of thing once you know what you have and at a, at a very granular level i think it opens up all sorts of new possibilities i mean obviously there's long tail and sort of multi-screen distribution uh, there's serving up to different audiences that all those pieces, but I, th I think the foundational piece is knowing what you have and being able to, you know, understand what the rights and restrictions and sensitivities are about anything in there. So every time I talk about this or with a new group that sort of new potential uses come up, that, but they all spring from that foundational piece of having this richly described, consistently described archive. And if we can get to that place, there's all sorts of interesting things, I think, that can spring from that. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Muppets and machine learning, gotta love that. Just a quick um, reminder, we've got a question and answer session at the end of this. So get your questions through, go to Facebook and Twitter and use hashtag digital directions and get those um, questions through to us and Josh will respond to them at the end of this presentation. Josh. 
Great, thanks. So a couple of quick takeaways there from Sally. So yeah, Muppets and Machine Learning and Marketed uh, Magic Bullet. That's a bit of a tongue twister. So I think what's interesting um, with them... Oh. Sorry, am I on? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yep. So um, yeah, so we heard um, from Sally there, but she mentioned another company called Pool Party. And that's an interesting segue to the next uh, session with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and a company called Torrentia is that you, you got to look for people that will work well together. And I think the, the world is changing, technology is changing. And what they did is they brought together different applications. As you've heard, these people are using our product, Curio, very often, like you need these other pieces to be in play. And that's what we're going to hear now um, with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And this is a video with uh, Rock and Roll, but also their partner, Torrentia, uh, where we interviewed them just because they've actually helped us make these integrations very simple and quick for the customer. So with that, we'll hear from Rock and Roll. My name is Jenny Thomas, and I'm the director of archives for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, which basically means that I oversee all archival operations for the Rock Hall and um, as well as our collections management system and our digital asset management system for the institution. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is the world's uh, first museum dedicated to the living, breathing legacy of rock and roll music with an extensive permanent collection of iconic artifacts and a robust range of educational programming for students and research opportunities for fans and serious scholars. Um, and since the library and archives began to take shape in 2009, we've been collecting digital content. Um, and at this point, we have approximately 650,000 assets in digital storage at the library and archives. Um, and that includes things like digital video and photographs from the Rock Hall's induction programs um, and the museum's educational series like Rock Hall Honors and Songwriters to Sound Men and a lot of born digital collections, you know, just on the history of rock and roll music. Um, so for us, metadata is really essential to helping us quickly and efficiently identifying and locating the files that we need and to know that we're able to use them. Because of the, because the majority of our institutional video content had been digitized kind of en masse and offsite and a lot of our you know, most of our born digital content comes from donors external to the institution. We didn't really have a lot of content that had embedded descriptive metadata. Um, so while we've been able to migrate um, into our digital asset management system, the descriptive metadata that our archivists have created since then, uh, the machine learning through Curio really allows us to expand that data set to include optical character recognition, speech to text and facial recognition. So we don't have to spend staff time and budget transcribing every induction ceremony or oral history in the future. And we can depend upon machine learning to provide us that route into our collections now. The machine learning metadata that we've gotten um, gives our staff across the institution really a quick and dirty way uh, to access our collections. And, you know, whether that's on a particular performer or a subject, and then, you know, if they need a deeper contextual dive or further interpretation of that content, then the archivists are here to provide that. Um, and it saves the archivists and our museum staff a, a, a ton of time in the long run. Um, for example, you know, if an inductee were to pass away in a weekend, um, staff would be contacted to start work on a press release and memorial statement, which usually involves video and a photograph. Um, today, our marketing and communication staff can locate a, a batch of photos on that inductee for themselves. But then if they need additional content about a photo or are looking for something that they just can't, that they're not finding on their own, they'll contact us. Otherwise, they're ready to go with that content nearly immediately making this process much more expedient and which is exactly what you need in, in that kind of scenario. So our oral history program in particular has really benefited from our ability to use machine learning for speech to text for transcribing. Um, our oral histories can range anywhere from an hour long interview with Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane to 
you know, three to five hours with every member of Leonard Skinner or the zombies uh, to eight hours long, which was a three day interview process with some of the great New Orleans uh, artists, uh, Little Richard, Bats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Dave Bartholomew. Um, so, you know, there's such a wealth of content there that could be used across education, documentaries, um, writing what is to become the history of rock and roll music, um, that being able to provide the transcripts, you know, within the time that it takes to process the file, rather than the three weeks it might take us to transcribe that ourselves um, is a huge benefit to our institution and to the history of rock music um, because we're able to provide that content so much more quickly and efficiently. So really understanding what metadata you have and how it's interconnected definitely helps you in the long run in a project like this and and then you know you get all the additional machine learning on top of that that just enhances everything. We have a brand new collection management system, a brand new digital asset management system, a new technical infrastructure across the entire institution. Uh, this great partner in Gray Meta in helping us with our machine learning, and a wonderful partner with Torrentia, who's now helping us figure out what the future is of packaging all of the content that comes out of those systems together. What does that look like? How do we do it in a way that we're providing the context around that content? Because, you know, as archivists, context is what's most important to us. Um, and we wanna be able to provide that in the most straightforward way possible while also being as comprehensive as we can with all of the, the data that we have about our assets. We heard Jenny Thomas mention one of Rockhall's partners, Torrentia. Torrentia, also a Grey Meta partner, specializes in the modernization of collections and digital asset management in the GLAM sector. I had a chance to speak to Adrian Cooper, Torrentia's chief product officer. Before joining Torrentia, Adrian was head of information systems at both the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, and the Victoria and Albert Museum, and a longtime consultant providing vision, strategy, and digital library guidance to galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Here's a clip from that interview talking to Adrian about the future of AI and its use in the glam sector. Um, we've heard from um... Uh, PBS, uh, Boston Celtics, um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Video Fashion about some of the, the, the current ways that they're using machine learning to, to help their business today. Um, I, I'd be very interested to hear about what your thoughts are in, on future op opportunities to use machine learning generated mm -hmm. metadata within archives. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I mean, I think there's a, you know, we, the you know, ability to generate tags and keywords and recognize people and, you know, places, etc. I think is, is uh, you know, is, is maturing at a, a, you know, an amazing, amazing rate. Um, but I think, I think with, with slightly more specialized domains, um, I think the, the there's a, there are opportunities for refinement of those, uh, of those tagging models, etc. to, to understand more, you know, whether that's, you know, um, you know, art or what, whatever, whatever it is that your you know particular uh, domain is, and to understand the, the, the terms, the entities that are, that are associated with that. So, so one of the one of the opportunities is is, is doing uh, more what we call semantic enhancement of of those records by taking the tags that have been generated through the OCR or the or the machine uh, vision process, and then cross referencing those. Against um, you know uh, uh, online you know you know kind of authority of online resource descriptions. So things such as Wikidata or the or you know or the, or the virtual inter internet authority file, where you've got these vast data sets of you know uh, of information about people, places, events, topics, etc. That are that are recorded and organised as as kind of authoritative data. If you can link your material to that to those then your machine learning models will vastly um, improve. And so, for example, you know, 
things like, you know, I, I mean, I remember, you know, back 15 years ago now, I think when, when I was first at the VNA and we, we were, we were looking to develop our first website and put the, the, you know, the collections online for the first time, because there are about four or five different systems in, in place, the library, the archive, the picture library, the collections, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, I remember the director saying at the time, look, what we need is the ability just to simply allow users or researchers or, in, or indeed in staff internally, just to type in something simple, like say, you know, give me everything about, you know, about William Morris and it, and it automatically returns information, you know, this is either books or archival documents or images or, you know, wh whatever it might be. Um, and that at the time seemed such a incredible, you know, it's a simple vision, but really, really, really difficult to actually achieve in, in, in practice. Um, and so I think for, for the, for, you know, not quite for the first time, but certainly the idea of being able to do that Quick, more quickly, more easily, uh, and then improve the ability for you know curators and educators internally to actually have access to the rich body of of, of material uh, uh, that, that, that that does exist, but has you know previously been held in these separate silos. Suddenly, makes it much easier to think about the the possibilities and the serendipitous serendipitous connections that have always existed between this material that have never actually been. Uh, really visible and easily available to uh, to that, which makes planning and 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 thinking about exhibitions and and, and books and, and other forms of research much uh, much more um, active and open. And and of course, from the from the visitor side, the ability to actually have you know have have uh, more easy access to this range of material is 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 huge. Um, and so you know, but but you know, there are obviously other other kinds of things where you might. You might want to consider, you know, how you can more easily join together, say, text, textual documents with with images or video and put them side by side automatically based on on what it is that you're looking at or, or you know, reading uh, where, you know, at the moment th those connections have to be, you know, uh, hand handmade. Uh, you know, if you're searching for if you're searching for content where you're typing in keywords, the ability to then. Or, you know, automate the, the the links to other things that you might be interested in, you know, based on the AI, AI, AI model, then again becomes possible because you've made these semantic connections between the underlying corpus of, of material uh, that, that you have. So I think there are some huge, huge opportunities for, for collections through, you know, uh, connecting, you know, um, you know, the, the material with, uh, with AI machine learning based uh, indexes. Very exciting. Thank you. Fascinating look at the options uh, in these areas, which I'm sure are only going to expand. A little bit of talking of expanding, um, a little bit of housekeeping. We'll probably go 10 to 15 minutes over uh, for the Q&A session. So please stick with us for that. Get those questions through on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag digital directions. Josh. Great, thanks very much. So uh, yeah, some takeaways here on the next slide, if we can, is uh, we heard there from Jenny that they were able to kind of respond a lot quicker to their needs. We also heard that from uh, Video Fashion and, and it's key. And like I said early on, it's about leveraging that human capital with the technologies like AI and machine learning. We heard it there directly. That's really what's happening is the knowledge that they have from the years and years of working in these collections is bringing that together and, uh, with the AI and the machine learning. Uh, with that human curation. So with that, um, now what we're going to do is we're going to hear from um, the Boston Celtics. My name is Jay Westland. I am CTO and Vice President of Operations uh, for the Boston Celtics. I've been here, this is actually my 30th season working for the Celtics. I think it's my 30th, somewhere in that range. Um, I started uh, as a courtside sort of statistics and scoring person the first year the NBA introduced computers to statistics and scoring. The Celtics had no computer people at the time. They brought me in. I started doing statistics with this new computer system back in 1990 and, uh, and never left. <laughs> it's grown and grown to the point where now uh, computers sort of run the company. Metadata, like for, for a long time, I hadn't really thought of it as metadata, but we over the last, say, uh, I don't know, 15 years, our digital video collection just started building and building it, and it quickly when when video went from tape to digital in roughly for us 15 years or so ago 
um, it, it overtook the infrastructure, the, the, the modest IT infrastructure at the time, and, and the video very quickly just dwarfed everything else we were storing. And, and it just started building and building and building. We had all this video, um, but, it, but it seemed all along that like nobody quite knew what to do with it all. What were we doing with all this, this video? And it, I say video, some of it is other rich media pictures and sound, but, but for the most part video, but rich media files. And uh, we would store it, but then it always seemed like when somebody needed something, nobody could ever find it. And so, so we, we long had this problem of we have all this terabytes of, of media, but still nobody could ever find what they needed. When you needed a shot of something, or you needed a video of this, and so nobody knew. And, and so what was missing was this wonderful thing called metadata and a way to then retrieve based on metadata. Um, so uh, maybe eight years or so ago, we put in our first content management system which helped us a lot because now we had a system where people could add metadata and metadata is for the sake is just the, the data that's telling you what's going on in some other file. Um, and so we could then start adding metadata to our media and, and organize based on the metadata and find things based on the metadata in the content management system. So that was great. Um, way to now we could actually start finding the video and finding things within video or in, in pictures and and that was a huge step forward but we even that we quickly learned was a flawed system because we were shooting so much and and downloading and, and acquiring so much media from all sorts of sources a lot of times it's just our own people with their own cameras and a lot of time it's from partners or wherever we're getting all this media from is everywhere we couldn't keep up with it. So we know that content creators couldn't actually input anywhere near the amount of metadata we really needed. So, so although we could do a lot better than we used to do, we still had a whole lot of files that had no metadata attached. So the content system didn't know much about it. Maybe if you were lucky, it was in the right year. Uh, if you were even more lucky, you might know that it was game footage versus some event at a hospital or something or some charity event. And so you had that much, but you couldn't get much more out of it because mostly we just didn't have the manpower to start putting the metadata in. Um, and so, you know, a few years ago, we, we started realizing that this metadata was really, this is key and it, and it matters to us. And somehow we had to get ahead of this game of a human being taking some footage and, and labeling it either, either overall as a clip or labeling it you know, second by second, and this second, you know, there's a player and he's taking a shot, and or it's a, a charity event. Here's a different player, player B, and he's kissing a baby. And so, so we we wanted, we knew that we needed a way to get to get ahead of the metadata game. On the the marketing side of our business, marketing and advertising side, we we're, we're just uh, only about six months into this project using. Gray Meadows Curio product to ingest our video footage and give us useful insights into what's there. Um, so rather than a person now putting in the, the metadata, we suck the video into the cloud um, and, and Curio sifts through it and does a lot of things for us. The first thing it does is it identifies if it's, if it's game footage, it identifies players generally based on Jersey number, because that's the easiest way to do it. So now we know the players that are in a piece of basketball footage, but it also can do facial detection. So if, if, the, if it's not game footage, if it's some other kind of footage, it, we can still find out who the people are in the video. So right away, now we know at least who the people are in this video that we didn't know anything about prior. Maybe we knew the date, um, but and then it can also find uh, you know other people. So if, if we're looking for video footage or the picture that has more than one person in it, we can now start searching on it and um, doing multiple people or things in the background. What's really useful for us as a business is being able to, to generate clips or pictures of specific individuals, players usually, and specific logos and things for sponsors and advertising purposes. So now we can use AI machine learning 
uh, to find it in, in, in log the people and the things around the people. So we go back and say, hey, I want player B with logo three, and we can find that. We, uh, on, the, on a similar front, we run sort of our business is, is separated largely in two halves. That's sort of the, the marketing, ticketing, advertising side of our business that we talked about. But we also have this very specific piece of our business, the basketball game itself. And we have a lot of similar projects that go on on the basketball side of our business. Coaches and scouts um, use sometimes the same exact video footage as a starting source or similar video. Uh, but they're interested in very different things. They're interested in the first piece is always the most important, who is in the picture, but what's happening on the court? Is it a shot? Is it a rebound? Did the shot go in? Was it made miss? Um, and then very specific things that used to be only scouts could do, which is what play was just run? What kind of play? And you know, the X's and O's of the, bas the game of basketball. Was it a pick and roll? Uh, where did the pass come from? Did, was he dribbling? Or you know, what kind of shot it was? And all of those things that we used to scout, we, we've had a long, um, project in place where we're working on adding machine learning. We're doing that with partners and we're doing that some with our own developers as well, because it's very spe specific stuff. It's a little harder to determine um, what kind of basketball play it is, because that's not as common as, is that a McDonald's logo or a Burger King logo, right? We can, so, so we've got similar projects on the AI and machine learning on the basketball side of the business um, that run in parallel with the, the sort of advertising marketing side of our business. The results are great because now when we need you know, for a specific purpose, whether it's an advertisement or some social media post or, or an in-game jumbotron clip or something, we can find it. Hey, Here's the introduction of Jason Tatum. So here's some great clips of Jason Tatum making dunks or whatever it is we want him to do. We can now go quickly find that and deploy it. So on a money standpoint, if, if we know we've got a sponsored ad or a sponsored post or a, a television commercial, we can quickly go find the relevant clips to that sponsor. Um, and that's just huge that this is stuff that you know, sponsor, we sponsor would call their salesperson and say, hey, I need a clip like this for this advertisement. And then the sponsor salesperson would call somebody in digital and the person in digital would say, all right, we'll, we'll climb through some video and we'll get that to you tomorrow or next week or whatever. And now it's like, no, go to Curio, punch in what you're looking for, Jason Tatum, Dunk, you know, logo A, and 10 minutes later, here's your video. And so the, the, the promise of being able to deliver those assets that we knew we always had. We had the assets, we just couldn't deliver them quickly enough. Well, now we can deliver them quickly enough so we can make more money there. Um, the other thing is on the bad, again, in the parallel on the basketball side, same thing goes on, but completely different. We used to have to have scouts and coaches watch video and tag it of all the games in the league. And you couldn't actually get to all the games in the league. So we did, we used to do what we would call self scout and opponent scout so we would do the the prior the, the the our opponents last three or five games we would log and our last three or five games and we would use that as data to generate insights about how to play the game ne the next night well now if we can teach the computer to do all that logging well we now log every game in the league every night and we have the entire leagues games from this season or even prior seasons although usually not that relevant this season on that matters um we can have that on hand so we now don't have to just restrict ourselves to the last three games or the next or the last three opponents or whatever we can look at, at all the data across all the games that have happened because we we can capture all of those games and log it automatically with machine learning the biggest thing i've learned is to do not be scared to take these leaps that when 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 some of the content creators in our organization came to me at first with this the first thing went into my mind is oh, we're too small we can't do this we, it's too expensive it's too big a project we can't there's no way we can use ai and machine learning like big companies like amazon do we can't do that but it turns out there's actually a whole ecosystem of AI and machine learning things going on in the cloud that even small companies, the Celtics are pretty small, can take advantage of. And so once uh, 
people got me over my fear of taking that first step and learning that, no, oh, you can do this. It's in the cloud. It doesn't really take that much work. It may take a little money, but it's not crazy money and it's not crazy time. And once you get that first leap and you start doing it, there, there's things that even a small company with a small IT infrastructure like ours can take advantage of and get great insights. Thank you, Jay, and thank you to all our presenters, and, and we'd like to wish you a really happy Thanksgiving over there in America. Um, before we get to the Q&A, um, and reminder, Facebook and Twitter, hashtag digital directions for those questions. Um, Josh, your take from that. Great, yeah, uh, quick takeaway and about a minute to wrap up here. I know we're running over a little bit, but look, so it's key there, like, uh, don't be scared, I guess, is something, but yet again, the, the money that it can and time it can save uh, with these and getting started. So with that, I'm going to just walk through uh, kind of my closing uh, points here to, to get across to the audience here and then we can get to Q&A. So look, don't get caught up in the blue sky ideas. Every one of those stories we just heard from, it helped their business. You know, you've got to really look at what are your challenges? What are you trying to do in your organization today? Um, and how do you bring some value to that? You know, look at the automation and you want to be able to get value for it. Don't just do something because it sounds great. You want to be able to tie it back to your business. The value really is about time. And we kept hearing it, time to do something. It literally will take months into weeks. We've heard this from so many of the libraries we've worked with. Things that took weeks take days. And then you get things that take hours, take minutes. So with using this automated machine learning and AI services with your team, you will save time. You will be able to do more with your resources. Set yourself up for operational success. Someone said it earlier, you want to go straight to production, right? Don't do something that's going to create another project after you've proven something. Um, you want to go straight to production. Plan for it to be operationally ready within your organization. And also make sure you get your finance departments involved. Everyone we work with, we're very closely connected to the finance department. This is really important, right? You really want to look at the what and the why. You've heard a number of stories here from these different libraries and organizations. Focus on these things. You want to know who was in it, what they said, where something was, what was it. We talked about Muppets and Big Bird and Sesame Street. They focused on these things. Don't get caught up around the axle on the how, right? The technology is great. There's lots of choices. You don't have to get locked in. Uh, you can change as technology gets better, and it does over time. So stay away from the how. Get some partners, what were your internal departments, just really focus on the what and the why, and you will have success quickly. And it won't be that complicated, and you don't need to be scared. You will have to make choices, and this is why we wanted to bring in people like Torrentia and, and have uh, stories that people talk about how they integrate it into other systems. You don't have to do it all at once, right? So there might be some things that wait a year. You might put some other stuff on hold. You might pick two key pieces to get going at the beginning. So again, you've got to get with the stakeholders in the room, and not everybody's going to get what they want. Key here, metadata is key. We've got that point across in this session. There are many ways of using it, as we've heard from these different organizations. Um, you've really got to get it treated as a currency. We found that education is key, enabling people to start to understand about it. Not everybody is a metadata expert. Um, but you've got to get it with your organization so that it does matter to everybody and, and as a currency that gives value across your organization. And with that, the key, all four of these people, they, talk, they started. And again, like everything in life, if you don't start, you can't finish. Don't be afraid of it. It is actually pretty simple to get started. Um, you may make some mistakes and it may be scary at the beginning, but don't be afraid of it. So with that, um, back to Thorsten for some questions and answers, but getting started is key. Absolutely key. James uh, who asks, is Curio the in-house Grey Meta software library platform? Okay, th thanks, James. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we did this presentation not really, really about our organization, but really about the marketplace. So didn't really talk too much about Grey Meta or Curio. But yes, Curio is our machine learning metadata platform that connects up to any type of asset, uh, be it on-premise or cloud, and creates the type of metadata uh, that we've heard about. And it can be run as a SaaS product or it can be installed on-premise Thanks, Josh. Uh, another one, I think this one's from Nick. What's your position and thoughts on the accuracy of machine learning and cognitive services? 
Um, yeah, this, this always comes up in the first couple of meetings. Look, if you're going to look for it to be 100% accurate, you, you, you're going you're to waste a lot of time because not everything is going to be 100% accurate. We've seen many times within these libraries that something might have a confidence score, which is the way that this is scored, of like 37%, but it's actually still useful metadata. A good example we had was with the PBS library and the barbecue smoker. The machine understood a barbecue to look like a kettle uh, barbecue that we all may buy, but it turned out this was a smoker on the back of a trailer. So the machine hadn't been trained to understand that, but it was still correct metadata. So I would say, don't throw away things that are below 99%. And the machines do get smarter. And with a lot of the tools and platforms out there, you can use your own libraries and your own staff to actually make um, the results accurate. So don't get caught up on 99%. Uh, look at the data and use your team just to dig in. So that's my response to that one. So that's an ongoing process, which leads to another yeah. question, um, which is over the last 12 months, what has surprised you or what you've been glad to see in improvements in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's moving fast. I would say every kind of three to five months, we see that uh, whether it's with our own machine learning um, or AI services around faces that we're building or where we plug in with other partners, that it really is um, getting more and more accurate. And it's in its deeper description. So computer vision descriptions of, of video or images or things we see it's always been pretty good, but in the last couple of months with a number of customers, it's got so descriptive that it said a boy and a girl in the back of a car with sports gear, right? And that's just general services. You don't have to invest a lot of money to get that accuracy. Six months ago, it might have said people in the back of a car. So I think because more and more people are adopting it, um, we're able to get more and more data out of it. And even with people down there in Australia, we've seen that some of the services we're using have identified buildings the people in Australia didn't even know what the building was. So I think constantly it surprises us. And it's I think it's coming because more and more people are actually adopting it, which means these libraries are actually getting smarter. So it's definitely getting better every three to six months. I think the, the next one's probably a follow up question to that. So from your perspective, where do you see this technology going into the future? I mean, again, I'm not, not a futurist here or anything. I, I see that um, if people keep adopting it in the way that they are, and again, starting, and we heard from Jay, it doesn't have to be the big organizations. We read a lot of the press around these big, huge Fortune 500 companies that are adopting AI machine learning. But I think if we get more and more of in this glam space of people actually feeding these machines, I think we're going to really start to see that more and more libraries can kind of get this rich, intelligent metadata. And we're going to find more and more use cases. And a lot of these collection management systems, I think we're going to reach the audiences or the, the fans or whatever it may be a lot better with this information. And that's going to be coming over the next 12 months or so. Fascinating to see. So it really is about scale and, and getting as much input as possible. Yeah, so again, a lot of these libraries are large, and I think the most, the more you can put into it um, and understand your library, and you're going to get things like bias and different things that are happening, is definitely, it connects as much of your library as you can as possible. Don't just say, hey, I'm going to take 5% uh, of my library and, uh, and try this AI machine learning thing. Try and connect it up, whether it's on-premise or cloud storage. Um, try and understand what you have and run these services against it. Um, and again, I think it's really important that the financial departments within organizations are brought in early on. What we've seen is if, if the financial side of this is left out to the end, it definitely slows things down. So as, as you heard from Jay at the Celtics is bring in the finance side of the house. And you'd be surprised that if you plan out the business model of this well, um, you're going to get started and find those successes quicker. That kind of leads to what I think will be our last question here. Um, what advice would you give someone who's trying to figure out the best way to get buy-in across different teams with a range of technical or computing knowledge. And this comes down to the, the people power or the, the human capital, as we call it. We, I think what you've got to do is you've got to find the people in your teams um, that maybe seem scared from the outside because they don't really know about it, or maybe they, they work for the last five to 10 years in a role that wasn't around technology. But what you've got to do is find those people, bring them into the room. And I think it starts with education is don't let people be scared of the buzzwords, educate them on the basics, show them uh, the good thing with a lot of these technologies we've talked about. You can see the results. You can actually see it happen. So I would say embrace them early, 
do not uh, g give up on education. I think you've got to share the information, let them try it, let them play around it, let them have a voice about where they think it's not good enough and how they think it could be better. So uh, I would say education is key and communication with that and get the teams involved early across your organization and find those silos, those stakeholders and bring them into the room, bring different departments in. And I think that's, that's gonna be the best thing that you can do is education, communication and getting more people involved. Always good advice, I think, on anything new. Um, we do have one last question that's come through. Um, and it says, this has been a strange year. Have you seen an uptick in interest or engagement during the COVID period? It's definitely a strange year, I can tell you that. Um, this time last year, I was down there in Canberra, so I, I missed coming to Australia. But until the vaccine's out, I won't be coming back. So um, good question. The answer is yes. And uh, we're seeing it with... Um, some of the more smaller organizations, we had a number of people that weren't using this in February and March this year, engaged in it in around April in pilots or POCs and are now going kind of full bore. So yes, I think, but only if there is operational value, if it's still a little bit of pie in the sky or blue sky thinking, I think those things are struggling to get buy-in as people look at that as we go into 2021, which I'm sure will be even stranger, and people look at costs, I would say if you can tie it back to the benefits to the business, like we've heard about on those four stories, it's going to make sense. Uh, we are seeing a lot of acceleration and adoption, and it's getting quicker to get started, to be honest. We used to spend months trying to work with customers to talk through, but we're now down to days or weeks. We can show it, have it up and running, one or two meetings, and it becomes ready to go straight away. So, yeah, definitely strange times, but people are, they are having a crack at it. They are embracing it. Um, and I think the working from home is helping because, um, they're not getting caught up in all the usual meetings they were. So, yes, that that probably is part of it. Uh, but it has been fascinating to see how um, lockdowns and um, working from home has really changed the digital environment and and forced I think individuals and companies into taking up some of these innovative solutions. So, thank you very much for the presentation to today, Josh. It's been fascinating. Great, um, great stories. Thank, thank, thanks for having us and uh, inviting others along to share their stories. And uh, yeah, great. I wish everyone uh, a safe end of the year. Thank you, Thorsten. And, and to you too, Josh. And um, for everyone out there, thanks for being with us today's uh, morning session. Next session will be starting, I believe, at 1 p.m., but check um, your registration uh, details. But please join us for the next session. And um, thank you again, Josh. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you.